And we're live. Welcome back, everyone. It's been a while. But I guess a lot has happened since then. So we wanted to have yet another um, EH Cash Dev meeting. Um, first of all, to mention a little bit the work and some of the details of what was done with regards to performance for the release candidate, the first release candidate. And then also we've got a number of open issues that uh, were discovered recently that may require some discussion. And so this is a good forum to have that, to have these discussions. Um, who wants to get started around release candidate one? Maybe Ludovic, you're pretty much the best person to explain what was found out and some of the ideas we put in place. Uh, I think the most notable thing to speak about in release candidate one is the performance improvement. Um, so after the, the M5 release, we started seriously working on performance work, so um, measuring our stuff and trying to implement what was wrong. And there were tons of places where we were underperforming and we improved drastically in some areas. There, there are still some uh, lagging behind, but uh, we're working on that at the moment. So uh, in particular, what what exactly did we improve? Is it worth going into the details? Well, maybe we can. So clearly, um, there was an open issue for a long time in the issue tracker, which was investigate the churn problem that was yes. discovered way back. So that's clearly a topic. We can probably say a bit more about that. Yes, so uh, investigate the churn. So we noticed that when you do 100% uh, gets on a cache, we still generated quite a lot of garbage. And uh, that has been investigated, and yeah, and compared to EH Cache 2, and we noticed that, yeah, each time you, you, you do uh, a get, there are uh, a few objects that are created. So uh, that being identified, we did whatever was needed so that uh, now when you do a cache.get, there is no object created at all and no garbage at all. So we're doing even better than EH Cache 2 because EH Cache 2 still uses the Java util locks, Java util concurrent locks, can't remember, that do generate a bit of garbage when you, I think, unlock or whatever. So yeah, no, it's completely garbage free, the, the, the get pass of a heap store. Um, so it's also faster than EH Cache 2. Um, anything else on the top of your head, Louis? Well, yes. and, and so clearly the, the way we ended up tackling that though um, has been, so one of the reasons we had churn is because we initially went with a single implementation of the Cache API which would handle um, a cache with a cache loader writer and a cache without. Um, and the way we did that was by simply um, adopting a functional style. I'm, I'm going to insist on the style because we have lots of side effects. But at least the functional style which allowed us to pass from the higher, like from the, from the cache implementation, we could pass a lambda that would get executed all the way down at the store level under lock, um, allowing us to really simplify some of the uh, concurrency um, concepts and concerns we could have with regards to operations. And while it works really well for the development and allows us to keep uh, pretty strong um, abstraction and stuff like that, we realized that the performance cost when you have a pure on-heap cache was just too much. And so what we ended up deciding to do was, okay, let's split the implementation, let's have one implementation that just handles um, so which is a cache implementation that just handles normal caches, I would say, so no cache through, no read through, no write through. And let's have another implementation that still behaves that way when you have read through and write, write through enabled. And where it makes sense because the moment you do read through and write through, you accept that your cache um, is taking a bit longer um, in the sense that it has to do the read through and the write through operation. And then the cost of the get is probably minimal compared to the, co the cost of reading in the, in the underlying system. Um, and so that's that changing that has had a number of impacts on the on-heap store mainly. Um, and then the other stuff we looked at um, and which kind of 
is probably a, a feature we can like brag about with regards to performance, which is the whole idea of having custom serializers. Yeah, that, that really is a, a big ticket. It was a bit painful to get working, but it's now seriously paying dividends. Like uh, my latest measurement seems to show that the off heap store is uh, less than an order of magnitude lower than on heap store, store by reference. So it's pretty impressive. Um, but okay, under a cert certain conditions, like if you have, if you're using key values of special classes that we do optimizations for, like for instance integers, longs, ser uh, strings doubles, like all the, the, the common thing. We have uh, specially uh, crafted uh, serializers that make serialization and deserialization extremely swift and cheap. So you, you pay almost no cost of going off heap there. Well, almost no. It's still something like eight or nine times lower than on heap by reference. Still, okay. and so that's clearly going to be something we will need to document and really advertise. Yes, is that, that flexibility you should use it as EH cache users. If you end up using off heap or disk, or if you end up requiring that the caching is done by value um, on on heap, like for instance, you should yeah JSR one or seven does by default. Yes, exactly. You should really invest into efficient serializers, and if we're just talking about on heap, um, efficient copiers. Um, yeah, yep, and so and so, what we worked on there, um, mostly at the off heap level, is make sure that the um, um, the values get deserialized only when needed. And we've got a number of internal operations uh, when you have multi tiers, for example, um, where you actually don't need the value; you're just touching the metadata. Um, and so, based on that, uh, we've uh, We've also gained um, a few percent here and there. Um, well, a few percent if you add everything up, uh, it's. Yes, I think it's without the serializer, it's something like 50 percent that we gained in the end. Yeah, and and and, th and that's also something we we need to work on is have some basic tests that can live somewhere either in the GitHub repo or a or a new repository, but that will enable others to look at what we're advertising, the differences with EHCache 2, how EHCache 3 is better, and some of the tricks that you need to take into account for making it really better. Um, so that's that's also upcoming work. Um, anything else on that topic, guys, from the performance point of view? Uh, we could also say that we're not yet done, so it's still oh, yeah. an ongoing process, so we're still going to improve performance for our, yes. uh, when we release our next release candidate. Yeah. Chris, do you want to say a word about the improvements that were made to the Orphip library to enable some of the performance <coughs> optimizations? Um, it does native. So one of the one of the problems that, that was happening in Orphip was that, that Ludovic identified was that any time the, the, the compute-like operations that were being used by the, the loader writer variant, well, at the time, were being used by everybody because this is what was done before the, the split was, was completed, um, were using compute methods on Offy, but Offy doesn't have compute methods. And so it was performing multiple um, lookups against the Offheat maps to do these methods by locking the segment, doing the get, looking, getting, seeing what you got, doing necessary evaluation of the value you got and then deciding whether they wanted to do a put whatever and then there'd be a secondary lookup then. The problem with that is that the main problem with that is you get multiple key deserializations in order to do the equals comparisons each time but you know that you've got the thing under lock. It's not going to change. Um, and so we added compute methods to off heap and they're not the JDK8 compute methods. They're for, because because we're still 1.6 compatible and, and, and therefore we couldn't use the 1.8 functional interfaces. So so what we've added are compute with metadata methods. So they're in they, they can operate both on the value and the metadata tied to the to the val to to the entry at the same time, and they're explicitly avoiding clashing with the 1.8 versions. But what they do allow us to do now is to do this whole thing in a one fluid single lookup single key equals comparison um, 
shot, which is a lot more efficient. Um, there are some there are some lucky intersections in what EHCache wants to do with those functions against some of the impacts the way things are implemented in off it might have on things like um, not liking functions that aren't nullipotent, i.e. aren't pure functions. But um, but luckily we've got clever intersections. Um, um, I guess I, I probably shouldn't say any more there. Well, it's not. There are certain circumstances where the off heap variants will want to call the function twice because they call it the first time, and then in the act of, act of calling it, um, and th then after they've called it, they go to use the value and realize that something got invalidated post post calling the function that requires them to have to call the function again, um, which is obviously bad um, if your function has side effects. Um, luckily, although some of our functions have side effects, which is not good. Um, it turns out that the kind of mutations they perform on the cache um, are safe in terms of not causing things to get executed multiple times. Yep, indeed. So that that that's um, a quick overview of what we did. If you're interested in following that more to the detail, just look at the RC2 milestone in the GitHub issue tracker and it will list all the issues that have been fixed and these should link to their PRs, allow you to follow up um, if you're so inclined to do. So that was that was one thing, RC1. Um, and of course, yeah, again, EHCache 3 early adopters, um, please tell us what you think about the configuration APIs, the usability, and everything, because again, the closer we get to the release, the harder it's going to be to change things. And once it's released, well, we can improve, but we can't remove. So, if we go back to open issues that have some pretty serious impact, I would say. Um, I think the first one we should probably discuss because we may want to resolve that in I don't know it may it may have interesting consequences. It's the one around um, transactional caches. So for the moment, um, we tested with one JTA provider. Selected um, at random. Selected at random. <laughs> by Ludovic. <laughs> um, and recently while working on splitting service dependencies I ended up um, tying myself in a knot because um, the, the way some of the tests were written and I think they, they reflect what would happen in an application you would have the cache manager being initialized after the transaction manager has been initialized as documented and it gets the transaction manager no problem, so the cache is the cache work and everything is fine. But then you would close the cache manager, which stops all services, reset the transaction manager because we were testing recovery and things like that. And when you reinitialize the cache manager, it would keep using the first version of the transaction manager, not the new one. And that's because the path to get the live transaction manager is a bit at odds with um, with the life cycle we want. So from the description, what we would want is the transaction manager to be used by the cache to be resolved when a cache is initialized. Um, but the way documentation explains that you have to specify it currently is you have to pass it by creating a transaction manager provider configuration which is a service creation configuration meaning it's going to be resolved and passed to the service only when the service is instantiated so once in the whole life of the service across multiple cache manager init close init close cycles um, and nowhere does that provider actually um, like um, 
benefits from the start and stop events. It's just mostly ignore them. And if it has a config, what it will do is it will get the transaction manager wrapper, which is a type that contains two elements for, for how XC stuff to work. And it will get that type either from the config it's been passed at construction time, or if there is no config, it will do the auto detection that we have um, that we provide with regards to the to the selected transaction manager. Now, if you realize from that description, there is an issue, which is that if you specify it by configuration, because you will, you may want to use another one, or you may um, decide to configure it explicitly, um, there is no way to, after having closing a cache manager, reset your transaction manager and hope that the cache manager will use the new one. And so, what it seems to me is that the config should really be at the service. So you should provide a service instance. And when, you, when we talk about um, programmatic configuration, it's pretty easy to do. We could, we could document that we expect you to provide a service instance, that maybe the service instance doesn't need to do a lot at start and stop, but clearly um, at least should resolve the transaction manager during start. Now, while that would work for um, programmatic configuration, it just doesn't work for um, XML configuration. Because in the XML case, what we, what we allow you to configure at the cache manager level are custom services, but the type we expect you to return is a service creation configuration, which will then trigger the loading of the service itself, like the default service implementation. And so it means we kind of in a case where what would what we would ideally want if I use what we have today is we would want the start of the service to be actually passed down to its configuration. But then it's like but then why is there a configuration? Why can't it just be a service? So that's kind of the the, the, the problem as I see it today. And I'm not sure what's the ideal solution, especially as like revisiting the complete service system so so late is probably not um, what we do hope for. So I don't know if Ludovic, if you want to add something, if if I was clear enough, so that we can discuss the problem. If we well, need to show code, I think we you were clear enough. Um, so to, to summarize the problem, it's uh, the ideal way to configure uh, the transaction manager in a programmatic way is to pass an instance. Oh. <laughs> I'm just I'm just going to confuse everything uh, everything more by repeating what you just said. Uh, so um, it's a problem you discovered, yes. Uh, it's a bit of a chicken and egg problem that we're having. Um, I don't know. I'm just surprised that it only happens with the uh, XA transaction manager that we have, haven't had any other kind of service before uh, running into that problem. Well, most of the other services aren't really external services. Or at least, that's not true. The things that create... They're, Generally they're speaking, every, the, the, the other things that are external are the factories, and they create something, and then it's destroyed, and then they'll, they'll get, and they'll recreate a new thing on reinitialization. But yeah, but we've, we've never defined a contract that explains, oh, this configuration, so in, in the context of XA, oh, this configuration explains to you how to look up the transaction manager. Mm. But if, if the default transaction manager provider was capable of interrogating the configuration and then doing a lookup, then it resolves the problem. It's, it's a bit, if you want, in, in the local persistence service, so the stuff that handles everything we save on disk, what does the configuration contain? A folder name. Yep. But that's not, that's not linked to the lifecycle of the cache manager or the VM. I mean, it's something that leaves even longer than that. And, and, and in XA, what we're really seeing is that the transaction manager is an object also and is life cycled outside of the cache manager. It feels so like this has 
Go ahead. It really feels like this has connections to the other one of the other topics you want to discuss. You're talking about life cycles and things that exist outside of the cash manager. Yeah, when you pass instances. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, it's true. Yeah, probably. Yeah, so maybe we should find a commonality between the two. So So it's it's true. So what Chris is looking at is another issue, which is the we had a discussion way back about class instance provider, which is an abstraction we have internally that allows us when you give us the class name from the the class reference for a loader writer, the class reference for a copy provider, for a copier. Serializer. No, serializer use no slightly different way, but it's, oh, it's yeah, the yeah. same problem. No, you're right. It doesn't use the class instance provider, but it, it works kind of the same way. So a class name for a serializer. What EHCache will do is it will instantiate these classes for you. And when it does that, it will, when you close a cache, or when you close the complete cache manager, um, it will release these resources. And the way it does the release is, since you give us a, a, a class name, it's going to look at, oh, does that class implement closable? Does that instance, sorry, implement closable? And if it does, it will invoke close on it upon release. And if it doesn't, well, it created the instance, but it just drops it on the floor because there is nothing specific to be done as far as EH cache knows. There is a slight difference when you actually provide us with a serializer instance, with a copier instance, like an already instantiated object. And what we decided back then was to say, oh, but if you hand us such an object and it implements closable, then we will invoke close on it because we don't care too much about how the object was created. If you tell us it needs to be closed, we'll close it. But it, it has some edge cases, of course, is that if, let's say you do that with a cache loader writer, which is able to access your system of record. Um, but of course, you, do, you will want to close it at one point to release the database connection and everything like that. But you probably don't want to close it from the first cache manager closing, if you've shared it amongst multiple. Um, but the only way to control that is to decide whether or not to implement closable interface. And that indeed feels a bit clunky on the side. Um, and so I guess when Chris wanted to revisit the discussion, is what it was probably to say something like, never close when you've been provided with an instance. But if we go down that path, don't we open the Pandora's box? Because what happens for services? If you give us a service that you've instantiated, should we start and stop it? I guess yes, because that's part of the service contract. You, 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 it's you, get, you get, well, decorate it's part of the service contract, but you get control. You can, you got two choices. There's, there's two rational, there are two, to my mind, when you're talking about closing something, there's two rational places you can close something. One is the thing that, well, no, let me rephrase that. There's two rational places, there's one rational place to close it. It's open to interpretation where that place is. The rational place to close it is the place it's created at. Um, depending on contract, that's either going to be literally the stack frame or an equivalent stack frame to the thing that called new or mm -hmm. open or whatever the, the, the mirror lifecycle method is that, that, that created the resource that needs closing. Um, or if, so it's either that, or if your contract says something to, like, 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 like you've got a service factory, then it's not that object, it's the thing that calls that object that should be called and closed. But at that point, you've basically got this model whereby if you've got a service factory, Right, you've got it. You, you call new, and it's that frame. It's the frame that's inside there that did the new. But equivalently, there's also an act of creation in calling the factory and asking for for it to call new, and then the close is called by the same thing that called 
the service factory, but it, it, it's either calling close on the service, in which case the equivalent inside there, it's going to do the equivalent cleanup to the thing it did inside the service factory. And those are the mirror frames. You, you, you yes, one is one's a service factory frame and the other's a service frame, but you can put one to the other, or the close method is on the factory itself and it passes the service, and then they are completely equivalent. But so, so I, th I think we've got two different use cases there because service has a clear contract that if you don't give us an instance, we'll instantiate the service, but otherwise we are responsible for start and stop. That's the whole point that a cache manager offers. But right. for instance stuff, like copier serializer and stuff like that, and, and cache loader writer, mm -hmm. by the way, we decided, or at least, maybe we didn't make the conscious choice, but at least that's what the API expresses today. They have no life cycle. They get instantiated, and then they get garbage collected. There is, no they close, there is no close method on a cache loader writer. There is no close method on a serializer or on a copier. There is nothing. And so we said, oh, OK, but we could be a bit nicer with our users. And if you know it needs to be closed and you want the cache manager to take care of it, just implement Closable. And then we will close it when it gets released. But we never said at any point, oh, the contract is different if you pass us an instance. The contract remains the same. If you implement Closable, we will close it. Right. If you want to but share it across multiple, don't implement Closable. Implement right. something else and handle it outside yourself. But 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 to me, those two things sound close only because of a particular implementation choice we made. We know that the, that the users want to configure uh, copiers one one of two ways. They either say, I want a copier that's an instance of this, or rather please, when you need a copier, call this factory, right? Or, here's a copier. The fact that those two things are both achieved through the same object, the fact that you go to the factory to retrieve the instance and not to create something, is an implementation detail. So, to my mind, in, in, in the user's head, right, they're saying... I want to use this instance. They don't even think, they, they, they're they not thinking about a factory. They're just saying, use this instance. So in their mind, there is nothing to call close. It's just, here's an object, use it. Use it for copying. Use it for whatever. Don't, they're not asking for a close. Well, if they don't implement closable, they don't get one. But yeah, but that's 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 backwards. Yeah, but the, inter the closable interface is called closable, not mandates closing or closed by the first thing that will that what decides it should do it. It's called closable because it can be closed. It's not called closable because it must be closed by the first thing that makes the slightest judgment that it that, that some life cycle of some other possibly unrelated object is closing. Yeah, I can really imagine such object implement. Such a class uh, of a serializer or whatever being implemented, uh, implementing closable just to be able to use a uh, try with resource, and then oh, getting it closed twice because uh, it's in the try with resource and there is also a EH cache. So I I think it's a really ill side effect that oh it's closable so we close it. No. Uh, we didn't create the object. We don't manage its life cycle. Isn't it a different API, though? Because try with resource is Java 7, and that's a different closed thingy, isn't yeah. it? It's, a, it's another closable interface that extends from the, the one we're speaking about, if my memory serves. What? Try with anything that's auto closable is try with resources closable. And yeah, close, but that's auto closable. Closable, ah, closable auto -closable. extends auto closable. Ah. So yes, anything that's closable is auto closable. Yes, but not anything which is closable, which is auto closable, is closable. No. So if you've done no, try no. with resource, we may not try to close it, because you okay, might. Maybe it was a poor time. example. So the problem's not or, the problem. The problem Ludovic highlighted isn't terrible. It's just bad, because you won't necessarily double close everything you might use in a try with resources, yeah. but you might double close so, some things. Yeah, yeah, depending on... At least okay. it definitely breaks the principle of least surprise. So, so is what we're seeing here that the way to resolve that 
is to say, so for services, nothing changes. The, the contract of the life cycle is pretty clear. And if you want to share a single service across multiple cash managers, make sure that start and stop on your service instance are no ups and that you invoke what's necessary to get the service ready and what's necessary to retire the service outside of these two methods. And that's a fair contract. We agree with that. Because we brought that in the picture. Okay, cool. Yes. I saw at least one head nod. Okay. And, and so for the copier serializer, mm -hmm. cash flow the writer, what we're saying is that we should invoke closable only if we knew it. Yes. But so, what do we do then? Do we stick with the closable interface? Or do we go the full way and add a close method on these types? I think it's totally fine to say, if it's closable, we will close it. If it's closable and we knew it, then we will and close it. And we knew it, then we will close it. If it's not closable, obviously we, we won't. We assume there is nothing to release. Although why, there's actually a question about auto-closable. No, why not simply adding a, a, close, uh, a close method on the uh, serializer interface and other kind of interface? Then it would be way more obvious than, oh, yeah, you forgot to, to implement closable. If you don't need to close anything, leave the method empty. No, but, huh, yeah, but then it forces you to implement one more method, while the opposite is, I'm coding my cache loader writer. I'm like, when does that get closed? Look up the doc. Oh, I have to implement closable. That gives me a close method. I do it, and then I know. I have the impression that it's it's always, again, it's, it's, a, tension, like it's a tension between usability and, and things, but I have it. Some people, when they, you know, they will do new serializer, like uh, my serializer implement serializer, and they see read, write, all these methods, and then suddenly they see close, and they're like, what, what do I need to do? Well, read the Java doc, and it says, oh, if you don't, if you haven't opened the file or something like that, leave it blank. Yeah, but then we can have the Java doc of the of the serializer API that says, if you, if your in implementation requires to be notified when the serializer stop being in use, then please add the implement closable, and then we will close it if we knew it. You do have a point, yes. Um, uh, I think it's all documentation, and I'm, yeah, I guess, I guess I'm not too keen in adding just a close method all across the board, especially when we know that, for example, copiers will be mostly stateless, as they should be. And only very few serializers will end up being stateful. Cash to the writer, it's a different discussion. I would, maybe we could just do it for these ones, because honestly, a cash to the writer that you don't close, it, it smells like resource leak. Yeah, what we could do with the cash loader writer is make that interface extend from closable. The other thing you can do with serializer is to make serializer itself an abstract class with an empty close method and make that implement... A, 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 well, actually, no, just make it an abstract class with an empty close method. Oh, I don't like that. That way, that way, the closes doesn't have to be implemented in every subclass, but it is there. Twenty-one. The the the. I wouldn't call that a solution. I would call that okay. uh, yet another trade-off. Okay. Yeah, but in, enough, the case, in the case of the serializer, it has benefits, actually. Because the serializer is one of these weird classes. Mm -hmm. right? It has benefits and drawbacks, both. The serializer is one of these weird classes where the Javadoc explains that you're supposed to have very specific constructors, depending on how your serializer behaves. Mm-hmm. Um, but at the same time, if you make it an abstract class, then you can be explicit about the constructors. But if you do that, then the drawback is that, I mean, it's it's a, it's still an open question, serialization and clustering. Because they will need to interact with the cluster to save state, potentially, as we have in HCache2x and Trakata 4.3. 
So I'm pretty sure we'll have to add a variant and say, oh, if you want your serializer to be considered for cluster, you need to do that too. I don't know. Hmm. Okay, we, let, let's 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 leave it at at the minimum change. Um, let's let's say we no longer close. We we keep the close contract as it's described today, but we add the the nuance that we will only close if if we nude. Mm -hmm. Okay, I'm in favor of that. But, that but if we can we think about, again about the XA problem for a minute and <laughs> see if yeah. our decisions help? I don't think it does directly because the problem with XA is the, the disconnect between if you want to use um, programmatic configuration, we should document that we expect you to give us a transaction manager a transaction manager provider implementation, where transaction manager provider is a service interface that has a start and a stop method, and then you can do the lookup in the start, and in the stop you can release any resources you don't use, or you no longer need. And then if the cache manager restarts, well, you can again re-lookup the, the transaction manager, or do nothing if you know it's always the same because you're in an application server context or something like that. And, that's, and that works, I think. The problem comes from XML configuration or um, non-instance-based um, configuration, I would say. Because currently, um, mostly XML, what we do is you have to provide us with a class which is um, a transaction manager provider that we will instantiate from which we will extract the transaction wrapper, the transaction manager wrapper, which will which we will then inject in the transaction manager provider configuration so that the default transaction manager provider can get at it. And that's like very contorted, but I understand why it's that way. It's because from XML you can't specify a service class, or can you? Am I just wrong? No, I think you can't. You can just specify your service creation configuration mm -hmm. because because the XML does not produce a working cache manager. It produces a configuration which is just static and doesn't contain services, or does it? No, it only contains the service creation configuration and the cache configurations. It doesn't contain live services that are to be used as instances. And so here we have a chicken and egg problem. Here we have a relationship that we have a hard time describing because of that, the fact that it's really tied to an instance. And so what I ended up doing in one of the latest pull requests before raising that issue is that the configuration, which has a get transaction manager wrapper, doesn't have a field. Well, it still has a field because it still accepts the old interface of getting ejected with the wrapper. But if the field is not being set, it's just going to do the lookup each time it's being called. And because I know it's only being called once when the cache gets initialized, or the cache manager gets initialized. No, actually, it's per cache. When the cache requests it, because the transaction the default transaction manager provider is just a pass through. Oh, you've got a config? Oh, let's ask the config. And the config each time says, oh, sure. I didn't have a specific one, so I'm just going to look it up. And then maybe what you need to provide then is a... Uh, but then XML is still broken because this is not the type XML makes us instantiate. XML makes us instantiate the service type from which we get the transaction manager wrapper, which we put in config. So we probably need to change at least XML so that we tell you, oh, provide us a configuration type, and we expect that configuration type. Um, expect that configuration type to not cache the value, but recompute it on demand, because it may be called at very different point in times. And here I'm speaking about time in, like, really time passing, the application time passing. 
but that still feels weird, to be honest. Do you want to throw a cat amongst the pigeons? Sure. Something was bugging me, and I went to write a unit test while you guys were talking. Sorry. All of the output stream implementations that Java defines that take objects that take out output streams in their constructors and wrap them and put up, add extra functionality. So object output stream, block data output stream, filter output stream, blah blah blah. Um, when you close them, they all call close on the thing they were passed at construction time. Yeah, but that's it's wrong. No, 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 reasoning. no, 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 it's not wrong by our reasoning. Because what you're doing is wrapping, which is not what we're doing. We're using. You're, you're comparing. Ooh, that sounds like it's just the way you look at it, point. No, 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 no. No, no, no. no that's why there are you're... two different different drawings in UML. Yeah. The black arrow and the white arrow. You're, the you're... cycles are bound together or they're separate and use each other. You, when, when you wrap an existing output stream in another output stream, it's because you're chaining them. And so you expect when close is called on the outermost that it closes everything in the chain. It's like it's like you're creating a chain, which is Wait, very so it, different. It's favoring one pattern over another pattern. It's favoring yes. the pattern of yes, you only ever want to use a stream for one purpose over you might want to write to a given output stream with an object data output stream, and then you might want to write some raw bytes, and then you might want to write this and, and write that. And, and, sure. and, and in that case, you don't call close, you call flush. Yeah, you call flush and you so close everything at the using end. It. Yeah. You could, you could close really at the end when you're done completely. And, and I think the, 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 the fair comparison is the one you used when we discussed that, that issue the first time, Chris, is if a serializer is past an output stream and when it's done writing to it, decides to close it, that's wrong. And I agree with that point because that's a completely different usage. It's something which is not an output stream dealing with a provided output stream and deciding on its own, oh, yeah, I'm closing it. I'm done. I'm closing it. I don't care what you want to do. Well, it's more the types. It's not It's not wrapping, like Ludwig pointed out. It's not wrapping. And the reason it's not wrapping is because the types are distinct. Yes. It's the type relationship that makes it not wrapping, I guess. Well, Sorry, that was a slight diversion. But. No, no, but but uh, yeah, I think I think it's it's a fair point. Um, so back to XA, hmm. I don't know. <laughs> is is there so? Is there any user of the XA caches out there? <laughs> yeah, that's that's going to be interesting to find out. But from what that was rhetorical, seeing, right? You didn't actually. Well, we can't have answers right now. Oh. I could, oh. Sure, that was rhetorical, but hey, if you are an XA user, it's about time that you show up, <laughs> because you might have your, your saying into that story. I clicked on the Q&A to see if I, we could have Q&A at least, and it tells me this feature is disabled, so I guess we can't have Q&A. So if you're listening, really? use EHCash users or EHCash dev, but I can't enable Q&A. <laughs> it's in the YouTube comments. Yeah, or YouTube comments. Um, so really, the, the, I think we have a clean answer for um, programmatic. The complexity comes from um, XML. And I think for XML, we won't have something really clean. We just need Dindy. to write. Hmm? Dindy. Dindy lookups. JNDI. I was joking. You don't want to force a front use Dindy for things. Uh, yeah, but I think that's... It's effectively, you have to have something like that, I f it feels like. It's what it's heading towards. It yeah, has to be... Yeah, but, that, but, but that, that's what I'm saying. Then it, it needs to be that there is a special contract on yes. the transaction provider configuration, and that contract, it's, it, and maybe we should rename the method. The method is not get transaction manager wrapper, it's resolve transaction manager wrapper. And so it clearly indicates that we're not expecting you to return us a field. If, if your implementation and your use case 
is limited to that, go ahead, but otherwise realize that this is a method we will end up calling multiple yeah. types. We're multiple trying to resolve types. something that we know has Isn't a life cycle that is greater, bigger than us, always will be, in oh, principle, bigger. Might, 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 in certain circumstances, be, be coincidentally the same as us, but in general principle, is big. Yes. Ludovic, any you think what we're saying just makes no sense, or does it? It does make sense. Yes. It's just that uh, thinking about it uh, from the top of my head, I also can't find a, a really nice solution we would all like. Mm -hmm. We need to give this more thought. Well, it sounds like maybe this is a situation where there do need to be multiple implementations of this service, and one of them would be a Jindy lookup. And one of them would be, uh, maybe one of them would be a reflective field call or something like you. This is my, this is the name of my lookup class, and this is the this is the name of the of the method you have to call on this lookup class. And what would be the control? Yeah, maybe we could provide some lookups. It, it, it could literally be, give me the name of a static class and the name of a static method on that static class and I will load that class and call that method and the return of that method is the transaction manager I will use. And I am allowed to call that method as, as often as I like to get the transaction manager. And you better return the right one at any point in time. And so, we'll probably cache the result for the life of the... But so, so that's the stuff we can easily extend in the future though. Because what we can do is have the transaction module just extend its XML configuration, provide more options, and depending on the option you pick, we instantiate the proper service creation configuration, which will create the proper service, which will know how to ask the rest of the config. So I think I think if sure. if we go down that path, which I mean, extensibility is preserved, but mm -hmm. what clearly is here right now should not go out with 3.0 because it's broken. Yeah, mm -hmm. Don't, we need to let's, find let's, a basic way of making it work yeah. for now. And, and 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 be honest, of all the time, I feel dirty saying this, but Jindy's not such an insane idea, because anyone that's going into the world of using full-blown JTA, there's a good chance actually they do have a container. Yes. Or if they don't have a container, a, a Java EE like full-blown container, there's a good chance they're running Jindy anyway for some other reason because somebody's looking up JTA through it, or they're doing this or doing that, or they won't bulk up putting it in for this purpose. Yeah, yes and no. I would disagree with that. I think the, the two most common use cases is, yes, you're within an application server, there is a JNDI server, so you can do a lookup there. Or you're in the same kind of environment, except that you're not inside an application server, you're in Spring. Okay. And you but have to be able to be to have the transaction manager injected to you or figure it out by yourself. Okay, yeah, so can we support injection? But the problem is then you've got the well, problem that you've got your only wired once, which is back well, to the, you could the be, same problem you could before. Be, you could be wired with the provider once, and that provider can do whatever it wants. Right, but that's not... How, how does it work right now if you're using transactions in Spring? Is the transaction manager... Somebody have to look it up. I don't want to think about this. Yeah, but 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 then I think if we if we just redefine that contract, the current contract we have is bad and doesn't work. So we need to revise that, and then potentially, so we have a mm -hmm. default transaction manager provider, which should just look it up from a config, and the config says resolve transaction manager wrapper, so it's no longer mm -hmm. yet. It clearly indicates. Fine. It clearly indicates. It less indicates a bean, but more. I'm expecting you to do some work, right? Um, and then, if we want in the future to add a GNDI uh, transaction manager provider, a Spring transaction manager provider, we can always add these at a later point because they will have a different configuration type, and that different configuration type will then trigger the proper load of the proper service. So I think that works. Mm -hmm. if and, but it doesn't need to be done now, because that's extensibility the way we want it. Mm -hmm. Okay, cool. So I'll, I'll probably add some comment on both of these issues we just discussed, um, yeah. so that they can be um, tackled.
while we were at it, we should rename the transaction manager wrapper class. It's poorly named. <laughs> you can yeah. add a, that note as well. Yes, but that's isn't that just an internal type? Well, no, it leaks through the um, through the API of the configuration. So yes, okay. The last issue I wanted to discuss is again linked to performance, and it's what you proposed, Ludovic, that the expiry contract be adapted so that um, when we um, do expiry for updates or expiry for access, um, the value you get is actually hidden behind um, a container type. And the container type, well, it's not even a container type. Chris used it callable. I think I ended up naming it invoker in the um, in the pull request I have out. And you invoke, and it gives you the value. And the, what it tells you is that the invocation may not be cheap, like you're deserializing. And the goal of that change is to say, well, if you don't need the value when you compute expiry for access or expiry for update, and you don't touch it, then you do not pay that price. Because the old contract was um, give me the value, but it meant we had to deserialize, even if we're, you were not using it. So I realized just before this meeting that the pull request I've pushed out is completely broken. Because I was, when I did the lazy value holder in RFIP, I was basing the laziness on the fact that if I do uh, an update access, it will actually deserialize. But this, what I've pushed out, no longer does. So it's badly broken. It, I think all the test passes because we don't really have any serious load test where the, the, the memory segment in Orphib could have been overwritten by another mapping and stuff like that. But so I'm, I'm reworking that. But it has some serious API impacts. It makes the type system very unhappy. Um, because, for example, for expiry, the expiry we allow the user to give is expiry question mark extends k question mark no question mark super k question mark super v because you could do an expiry for object object and it would be valid in a cache of string string um, and so adding that invoker which is then an invoker of question mark super <laughs> Ah, well, generics are a mess. There are a lot of. <laughs> was that a, was that a, was that a general statement or a specific statement about it? In in that specific case, generics are a mess. There are a lot of hard cast in there. I think I made even Chris uh, like discover my invokers dot row invoker of that just takes an object and returns the non generic type to make sure I don't have to add extra casts, but it's ugly as hell. It's really ugly. Um, so do we want to do that? What's exactly the performance benefit we gain from it? Do we agree that it, this is probably something we would... I mean, I, I would like to see real numbers, which needs I need to fix the pull request, but real numbers before deciding because of the impact it has. Yeah, I'd be tempted, given some of the statements Ludwig made about performance at this point of off heap in the place of specialized serialization schemes, which we'd like to be able to expand to cover the majority of use cases, with potentially the, the rest covered by users writing their own custom serializers, and have the Java sort of fallback of, of, of using Java serialization. I'd be intrigued to know how much of a difference is this going to make in the case that you are using one of the specialized serialization schemes. Alternatively, we could just make Louis try and fix the generics in this for fun. Hey, oh. Honestly, I've tried. I've even hit a problem where I don't need to cast with Java 6, oh. but I need to extract a local variable for the 7 and 8 compiler to accept it. Don't like worry. In line in 6, it works. In 7 and 8, it fails. Well, I, I'm, sure, I'm sure the compilation failure is totally self-explanatory. Oh, sure, yeah, it says type not blah. Type dollar one, dollar two, five, seven. No, not extent. even. Blah, blah, blah. No, no, not even because it's in cases where there is no question mark super or question mark extends. 
it's in cases where I have invoker v, invoker v, and it just... Honestly, I was surprised with six, seven, and eight fading. From the well, top of my head, Louis, uh, this thing, so avoiding deserialization before passing the object to uh, uh, the expiry policy. From the top of my head, I measured something like 15% difference. Gosh, 15 is a lot. Yes, but it was in a previous context, and we did a lot of changes since then. Yeah, so, so that's what I'm saying. We, but I need the pull request to be out, and then we need. It was far from trivial. Okay. Because think about it. Even a single initialization, it's going to be, at the very least, a few percent. Yeah. So it's never going to be done into the noise. We we might swallow the performance hit, but it's never going to be done into the noise. Okay, but I still, I still, do we agree that we want to see numbers before deciding on that? Sure, uh, I can rerun my tests. Well, wait till I fix the PR. Because <laughs> here, if you run a load test, well, I, it would be interesting if you run a load test with what's there. Do you blow up like. You mean a load test? Uh, a, r a real load test or a performance oh, no. test? Yeah, the problem is if you do just 100% get, it's going to work fine because you're no longer modifying off heap. You need to have at least some rights. Yeah, so. <laughs> because what I'm doing is. <laughs> yeah. For load test to work, you should first fix the uh, deadlock in the, uh, <laughs> the events. <laughs> yeah, there is that too. That's a nice one. Okay. I think we've spoken for a long time, so unless anybody has something else. It's probably a good idea to wrap up. I was, I, if we'd had the time, I was going to bring up the work that Cliff had, had done on the store provider stuff and the sure, fact that it makes it very yeah. easy. Oh. Yes. It's interesting. Go ahead. So as part of the work on Clustered, uh, Clifford's been working on modifying the store provider stuff. So that's the the part of the code that given a, well, describing the way it works now, it's the part of the code that given a set of resources configured for a cache will go off and figure out what store, or figure, will go off and create a store instance to back that cache. Um, and obviously, with the introduction of Clustered, um, we need the core of VH cache to be able to handle the creation of stores for resource types that are not part of its world. So within its XML namespace or within its programmatic API. So types it doesn't understand. And the way this was, the way we did this was Clifford implemented, a, like Clifford could speak for himself, I guess. But. <laughs> oh, go ahead. You're doing fine. So the way Clifford fixed this was to basically make it so that um, there's a new rank method on the store provider and you pass to that rank method the set of resources, um, which obviously might include resources from the core resources enum, which are the, the basic ones that the HCache knows about, and other and also may include other resources as well, along with the set of service configurations. Um, the provider is then supposed to return an integer that score that it that is its its score of how well it thinks it can satisfy those um, those resources and those service configurations. Um, a return of zero means I can't do this. Um, and then it picks the highest non-zero um, and non-negative. So I guess the highest positive, depending on your definition of positive mm -hmm. integers. Um, the highest rank and uses that store provider to build the store. Um, the way our providers work is for every resource that we can understand. Well, if we can, if we can understand the resource set, right? Do we return one, or do we return the size of the resource set? Right now, there are only two providers that uh, can understand more than one resource in the set, and that's, right. that's, that's the, uh, the cache store provider and the XA store provider. Yeah. And so they both return, well, the cache store provider returns um, a number equal to the number of resources that it, that it understands, and the XA store provider returns... 10 plus the number of resources that 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 
its underlying provider will understand. And the underlying provider is discovered by removing the XA uh, configuration from the from the list of configurations and then calling the ranking stuff again. So there's so we so we so the XA provider can be additive as opposed to replacement. So there's there's three upshots of doing this work that are well there's four upshots. The the the, the first one if you like the fourth one as far as users are concerned is it helps us do the clustered work. The three upshots that might be of interest to users right now um, this isn't in RC1 by the way this will be in RC2. Um, I guess that's right, correct, Lou. Um, the, the three practical upshots for users that be, would be picking up RC2 are one, it allows you to use um, off heap or disk in isolation without a heap tier, which the performance testing done by Ludovic showed, particularly with the off heap tier, that if you have a hot set that is much larger than your ability to hold that hot set, that, that hot set in heap. Um, you are better off just using the off-heap directly than, than than using a heap that's undersized. Um, so you can so if you're interested in just using off-heap directly, which obviously incurs serialization and deserialization all the time, but might be better because you're not full, not faulting and flushing to and from heap all the time. You can do that, and you can do the same with disk. Although I suspect that's less interesting. Um, the other thing you can do is you can um, write your own store wrapper in the same way as XA store does works. Um, you can look at that for a pattern of how it works, um, which would allow you to wrap, wrap our, our store implementations to make them do new things for whatever reason that you might want to wrap them, I don't know. Um, and, and, and the third thing you can do is if you are interested in implementing your own store that uses some other technology to back it, um, you can also um, do that and just make sure it returns either either if you want to if you want to override one of the core resource implementations you can return a higher rank than we currently do um, or if you want to implement your own resource then you can do that and implement a XML parser to parse it so you can use an XML configuration and, and so on and so forth um, so there's some, definitely some interesting things to play around with if you're interested in getting down into the guts of things um, with that stuff I confirm. And the free, the free just off heap or just disk was interesting, especially for just off heap, I believe. That's going to be interesting for some use cases. There's one thing you can't do in the X. Well, the configure the, the configuration to use a single resource in XML. Um, currently that's tied to heap. Is it's tied it? currently tied to heap. But, but that's changing um, soon. Well, as soon as somebody looks at my pull request. Although it can't change as much as I want it to because of a bug in Jaxby. <laughs> but, but, but that's another problem. So yeah, so, so that's, that's interesting. Yeah. Cool. I don't have anything else. It's worth discussing at least. Well, I think it's in, it's indeed a nice. So we yeah, like we've said, milestone five was feature complete, but the clustered work is making us do some slight, hopefully not too user facing API. Well, none of them should be really user facing, like the cache API and stuff like that is pretty stable. But we have some changes that come into the way services interact with each other, um, which we don't think is a big issue. Um, changing now because we don't expect to have much people implementing internal types of huge yeah. cache. There's there's been no API changes yet. There's been SPI changes. Yes, SPI yes. changes, right? Yes. And um, but also we gain sometimes free feature like the one we just discussed. So that's cool. I think it's indeed a good point to conclude this meeting. So I guess thanks everyone for listening. Thanks, guys, for attending and discussing. And yeah, I was going to say we'll see them in two weeks after RCT. Yeah, probably. Yes, that's the plan to have an RC every two weeks. Thanks. Bye. Bye. Bye.